be standing. We prepare now for the requiem of a public servant, the Honorable Elijah Eugene Cummings. And it shall be done in a few moments after the draping of the coffin by the honor God.
Elijah Cummins was a churchman, and he ordered as his opening hymn, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. We sang to the glory of God this morning that opening hymn that meant so much to him. be seated. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your servant, Elijah Eugene Cummings, who worked assiduously, sagaciously, and with integrity to preserve and protect the sacrosanct founding document of this country.
from enemies both foreign and domestic. Lord, we thank you for one who stayed the same wherever he was, as he ironically embodied Kipling's command to walk with kings yet not lose the common touch. Father, we praise you for Ruth and Robert Cummings who raised him in the fear and admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, we bless you that you lived in him, spoke through him, and strengthened him to do the work of kingdom building in the guise of a congressman and committee chair. Father, whereas we come to pay homage to a rose that grew out of concrete, a rock that refused to be overwhelmed by the rising tide of partisan rancor, and an oak that would not yield itself to the gust of intimidation sown by the tempest of corruption, fascism, and racism. Whereas we assemble ourselves today at this hollow time and in this sacred space, not for a public viewing, we already did that, not to award civic honors and accolades, we already did that, but we gather today for a homegoing celebration of a fallen soldier in the army of the Lord, a saint of God in the beloved. Therefore, we invoke your presence, we invite your spirit, and we inquire in your temple. And we say, come Holy Spirit, come heavenly dove, with all thy quickening power, and kindle a flame of sacred love in these cold hearts of ours. Lord, I pray that you would stand up in every speaker, but Lord, don't let them stand too long. Move through the music ministry and use the eulogist Bishop Walter Scott Thomas to do what he has always done, to declare the unsearchable riches of your glorious gospel. Therefore, finally, Lord, since to be absent in the body, is to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we ask you to comfort ye thy people in the only name that matters. In Jesus' name do we pray. Let the church say, Amen. We will now have the Old Testament scripture reading by the Honorable Elizabeth Warren, U.S. Senator. The New Testament reading of the Honorable Marsha Fudge, U.S. Congresswoman. Psalm, King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The New Testament reading comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have loved his appearing.
Elijah wrote his funeral program and determined who he wanted to do what. Some might be wondering why they're not doing anything. And so I just wanted to give you clarity. But one of the persons he loved to hear sing was B.B. Winans. And he's going to come now and bless us in song. my personal loss of my brother Ronald and my dad is that I don't have to be strong because I learned that in my weakness God's strength is made perfect I said God's strength is made perfect and today we stand on his promise and we stand on his word Go! 
after the pain oh he he's gonna come through yes he will he so much to the work that Elijah did and to his life. He asked that they might share some words at this moment. And I'm going to ask them to come in this order. The Honorable Hillary Rodham Clinton, former Secretary of State. <laughs> Honorable Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. The Honorable Kwaisi Mfume, Board Member Chairman of the Morgan State University. The Reverend Dr. Alfred Vaughn from the clergy. Mr. Larry Gibson, his mentor. And then Deaconess Margaret Ann Howey from New Psalmist Baptist Church. Secretary Clinton, won't you give her a hand as she comes? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Because this is the day for the homegoing celebration of a great man, a moral leader, and a friend. To Bishop Walter Scott Thomas and First Lady of the Church, Patricia Thomas, and the new Psalmist Baptist Church. Thank you for welcoming us all here to reflect on the life and celebrate the service of Elijah Cummings. And to the Cummings family, to his political family, the constituents from the Maryland Congressional 7th District, thank you for sharing him with our country and the world. And, thank you, Maya. As you have said so beautifully, you walked by Elijah's side on this journey. Thank you for your steadfastness, your resilience, and your leadership. It is no coincidence, is it, that Elijah Cummings shared a name with an Old Testament prophet <laughs> whose name meant in Hebrew, the Lord is my God. 
and who used the power and the wisdom that God gave him to uphold the moral law that all people are subject to and because of all people are equal. Like the prophet, our Elijah could call down fire from heaven But he also prayed and worked for healing. He weathered storms and earthquakes, but never lost his faith. Like that Old Testament prophet, he stood against corrupt leadership of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. And he looked out for the vulnerable among us. He lifted up the next generation of leaders. He even worked a few miracles. And he kept reminding us, life is no dress rehearsal. The American people want to live their lives without fear of their leaders. And as leaders, we have a responsibility to keep the promises made when running for office to make the lives of Americans better. As Elijah said, while we're all on this earth, that's my message. Our Elijah was a fierce champion for truth, justice, and kindness in every part of his life. His integrity and character, his can-do spirit, made him a guiding light in the Congress. He pushed back against the abuse of power. He was unwavering in his defense of our democracy. He had little tolerance for those who put party ahead of country or partisanship above truth. But he could find common ground with anyone willing to seek it with him. And he liked to remind all of us that you can't get so caught up in who you are fighting that you forget what you are fighting for. Even his political adversaries recognized that it wasn't really about politics for our Elijah. He led from his soul. He often said that our children are a message to a future we will never see. I saw that firsthand when I attended an event for the Elijah Cummings Youth Program in Israel. A leadership program for young people in his district. And Elijah didn't just put his name on the program and then forget about it. He interviewed every applicant. He was personally invested in their success. He wanted all of us to see our young people as he memorably asked us to do when he gave the eulogy at the funeral for Freddie Gray. Did you see him? By the time these young people came back from Israel to Baltimore, they had celebrated Shabbat, studied Hebrew, hiked up Masada. They had seen and been seen and made lifelong friends, all because Elijah Cummings knew from his own experiences, that it's one thing to learn abstractly about the world, but another to experience it with people different from yourself, learning from each other, lifting each other up. You know, Elijah often said his philosophy was simple. Do something. Go out and do something. 
No matter how daunting a problem seems, no matter how helpless you feel, surely there is something you can do. I think that remains his challenge to each of us. As he said, even if it seems small, there's usually something you can do if you are looking for it. You can defend the truth. You can defend democracy. You can lift up others. And toward the end of his life, he said, I am begging the American people to pay attention to what is going on. Because if you want to have a democracy intact for your children and your children's children and generations yet unborn, we have got to guard this moment. This is our watch. Our Elijah knew, because he was a man of faith and a man of the church, that life was fleeting and precious. And that's why he worked so hard to make every moment of his life count. When we're dancing with the angels, the question will be asked, he said, in 2019, what did we do to make sure we kept our democracy intact? I will end with the paraphrase of a poem that Elijah recited in his very first speech in the Congress. He said that he told himself this poem as many as 20 times a day. I only have a minute, 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, I did not choose it, but I know that I must use it. Give account if I abuse it, suffer if I lose it. Only a tiny little minute but eternity is in it. Thank you, Elijah Cummings, for your work, your service, and the lessons you leave us. God bless you. Good morning, Baltimore. Thank you, Bishop Thomas, for bringing us under this beautiful auspices to pay tribute to our darling, precious Elijah. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> Madam Secretary, Archbishop Lori, Bishop, members of the clergy, distinguished guests to all of you here for our darling Elijah. As Speaker of the House, I have the sad honor and personal privilege to bring the condolences of the entire Congress of the United States to Maya, the Cummings family, the people, the constituents of Elijah's district, people of Baltimore, to our entire country. I say that with great authority because yesterday, my friends and those of you who loved Elijah, yesterday, Maya gave us the privilege of having a celebration of Elijah's life in the capital of the United States. the first African-American lawmaker ever to serve in repose, lie in repose in the capital of the United States.
It was so beautiful. And as has been referenced, Elijah brought people together in life of different parties and in his death of different parties. And that's why I'm so pleased that yesterday's service was very bipartisan. In fact, it took bipartisan agreement for Elijah to lie in repose on the same catapult that Abraham Lincoln lay in repose in the Capitol. And so today we have a very strong bipartisan of Elijah's colleagues from the House of Representatives, led by our chair of the Black Caucus, Karen Bass, our leader, Stanny Hoyer, John Lewis, Marcia, who got the nod, and I'm happy to get it as well, and so many of our members of the House in a bipartisan fashion, please rise to be recognized. And their families and their staff, Elijah's staff. John Lewis, where are you, John Lewis? And we had a strong representation from the United States Senate in a bipartisan way yesterday. Today, also led by Ben Cardin and Chris Van Hollen, bringing so many senators here today. <laughs> Bishop Thomas, how brilliant was it of Elijah's parents to name him Elijah? As the, Senate, as the Secretary said, the Lord, the God is my Lord. And as we know from the Old Testament, there is a tradition to leave a seat at the table for Elijah, who might show up. But our Elijah always made a seat at the table for others. He made a seat at the table for children who needed an education for even new members of Congress so that he could mentor them. For all who wanted to be part of the American dream, Elijah himself personally lived the American dream and he wanted everyone else to have that opportunity, hence many seats at the table. How fortunate for our country that his parents also taught him to live up to his name. How blessed are we all to know him and to benefit from his friendship and his leadership. Elijah was a proud man, proud of his heritage, proud of Baltimore. Uh, <laughs> and proud of America. He always appealed to our better angels and to the promise of America, uh, calling us to live up to our principles and for a higher purpose. As he said, and this, this is so, all the words that we will use that are the best words are words that Elijah used. Was he was, when we were not meeting the needs of children in our country, he said, we are better than this. He held himself to a high standard, and that is why I've called him the North Star of Congress, our guiding light. Thank you, Maya, for giving me this opportunity to speak at the Baltimore celebration, as well as yesterday, of Elijah's life. Previously, I've seen some of you over time speaking as Speaker of the House before at St. James Episcopal Church to speak at the funeral service for Congressman Perrin Mitchell, a sad and proud day for the Baltimore community and our country that day. Paying tribute to Perrin was both an official and a personal honor. My D'Alessandro family and the Mitchell family have been friends for generations. <laughs> now it is my great honor and personal sadness to join you at the New Psalmist Baptist Church, Elijah's Church, to celebrate Elijah's life. As I said, yesterday members of Congress said goodbye to Elijah Maya gave us the honor again of holding that official service in the statuary hall of the house. At that time, I said this was appropriate because Elijah was master of the house, master of the house. 
In his chairmanship of the Committee on Oversight and Reform, he lived up to his responsibilities to hold the federal government accountable to the laws of the land. One word I would use to describe Elijah over and over again is the word future. He was there to make the future for our children, whom he called, as has been said, our living messengers to a future we will never see. But he wanted for those children to have a future worthy of their aspirations, and he wanted them to have a future built on our values, continue to be built on our family. And as a master of the house, he was also the mentor of the house. Uh, does anybody in here be mentored by Elijah Cummings? I think so. <clears throat> He, it was no surprise that when we had this election and we won the Congress that Elijah said, send me as many freshmen as you can because I want to help them be oriented to reach the full, their fullest potential in the House of Representatives. So wonderful that he did that. And all members, whether new or not, benefited from the generosity of his spirit, sometimes the candor of how we do our work, uh, whether we asked or not, the candor was there. And again, it was an honor to share, again, this, some of these thoughts about our dear Elijah. Elijah loved Baltimore and his district. He was my Baltimore brother in Congress. We had our chats about Baltimore all the time. He loved and respected his constituents. By example, he gave people hope by his courage he fought for what is right. By his brilliance, knowledge, and legal prowess, he made a difference in so many ways, fighting for gun violence prevention, expanding opportunity for everyone, recognizing, now this was the most recent, recognizing the cost of prescription drugs hurt the health and economic well-being of America's working families. He was willing to reach across the aisle, even across the Capitol, even down Pennsylvania Avenue. So it should be a source of pride to all of us who loved Elijah that the committee chairman immediately named HR3, the Lower Drug Cost Act Now, the Elijah E. Cummings Lower Cost Drug Now. Our Baltimore connection gave me special entree into the thinking, uh, Elijah's thinking, which helped me as speaker. Our love of the Orioles and the Ravens made it fun. Thank you, Baltimore, for your contribution to the greatness of the United States of America. When I spoke on Wednesday at my brother Tommy D'Alessandro's service, I acknowledged that we would be honoring Elijah today. We lost two great leaders in one week, we did in Baltimore. One thing that Elijah, one of the things that Elijah, my brother Tommy and I, uh, being from Baltimore and I representing San Francisco, had in common was the pride we took in Baltimore, our Baltimore. Another thing Tommy, Elijah and I had and I, in representing San Francisco, had in common that our hearts are full of love for America. I used to tell them in San Francisco, for us, love means letting other versions exist. And that's exactly what Elijah did. <laughs> respecting, respecting the views of others, reaching across the aisle, building community and consensus. Thank you, Maya. Thank you to the children and to your entire family for sharing Elijah with us and for loving him so much. He, you were the source of his strength and inspiration. I hope it is a comfort to you that so many people mourn your sad loss and are praying for you at this sad time. As we always pray for God to bless America, let us acknowledge that God truly blessed America with the life and legacy of Elijah E. Cummings. Mentor, master of the house, North Star, Mr. Chairman, master of the house, may he rest in peace, Elijah Cummings. Thank you all so much.
Good morning. Bishop Walter Thomas, my friend. President Obama, President Clinton, Vice President Biden, Secretary of State Clinton, Governor Hogan, Mayor Jack Young, distinguished clergy and all the pulpit guests that are all over the place, and ladies and gentlemen, Maya, those of us who are liars to his friends will forever remember him, but you will remember him the most. Every time the sun splashes on our face and warms us, we will miss Elijah, but you will miss him most. We loved him, but you would come to love him most. Please accept as you see the collective condolence of a whole host of Americans who share this moment in front of TV screens and radios, who will take this moment and teach it in schools next week, and who will share it with their own children. <laughs> Our prayers go out to his siblings, to his children, to all those who were related to Elijah. You know, he said to me, now, if you go before I go, don't get up there and wing it, Kwaisi. <laughs> he said, write it down. And then he said, no, I mean, really write it down. <laughs> so here we are. Whose woods are these? I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill with snow. Yes, those woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. You would think that the words of Robert Frost were almost written as if he knew that Elijah would one day be among us with his indefatigable spirit and his energy and everything he did and how he actually lived his life as if he did have miles to go before he would decide to sleep. He could be both provocative and evocative. He found a way to capture our will to dare to be different in communities all over the country and then challenged us to dare to make a difference. Elijah and I spent a lot of time in the last couple of years privately just talking about our own life, our own death, our own humanity, our own mortality, our own funerals, and whether he was going to go before me or I was going to go before them. And because I, I was three years uh, older than Elijah, he liked to kind of poke at me. And I said, Elijah, based on statistics, I'll probably be leaving here before you. And he would say, dude, I hear they're rather filled up downstairs where you're going, so you may have to get in line. <laughs> Sometimes out of the blue, he'd call me, st sticking it to me. So Kwesi, uh, what's it like now that you turn 40? Of course, Elijah was 37. Well, what's it like when you turn 60? Of course, he was 57. We used to call each other unannounced sometimes on birthdays just to say birthday, but we didn't do it with regularity because we wanted it to be different and a surprise. And, and I would get those calls and enjoyed every one of them. Surprised, you know, if he's going to call this year or four years later. And, and he would. And yesterday was my birthday, and I did not hear from my friend. I met Elijah in the spring of 1979. I was a young talk show host and had launched a campaign to run for city council. Elijah was a young lawyer and precinct marshal working with the Democratic Club headed by Senator Clarence Mitchell III and Mike Mitchell and delegate and soon to be State Senator Larry Young and John Jeffries and delegate Lena K. Lee. The political godfather and mentor to both Elijah and myself was, as you heard Nancy speak earlier, about the revered Congressman Perrin J. Mitchell. It was both, 
It was both the Mitchell family and the Cole Murphy family of the Afro-American newspaper that really moved our communities along. They organized, they directed us on politics, on inclusion, how to fight for rights, both civil and political. And so Elijah sat at parents' feet and I sat at his feet. And we listened and we learned and we began to get involved going all the way back to the campaign of Hubert Humphrey when neither of us knew what we were doing except passing out bumper stickers that said vote for Humphrey. Elijah was being brought along and tutored, as I said, by the Mitchell Club. I was being brought along and tutored by the late state senator, Verda Welcome, who was the first black woman in America ever to be elected to a state senate. So despite those organizational allegiances, Elijah and I became political buddies right away. We were both eager to just find a way to strike out and to change the system that had maintained discriminatory practices in housing and in education and employment and health care as it worked to deny political power. He was attracted to my grassroots campaign in 79 to run for the city council with no money at all. And I knew and he knew even though he didn't say it and we didn't discuss it at that time, that one day Elijah in the not too distant future would be running for himself. I would go on later that year to get elected to the city council winning by three votes. And Elijah, who had met my grandmother, thought it was funny. They came to me and said, now, Clayesi, as long as you are black, which meant the rest of my life, <laughs> you just remember those three votes were the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and you can't go wrong. Now, although it would be chronologically correct, Bishop, to suggest that that's how Elijah got started, it would be a gross understatement of where he really began. That shaping and that beginning started in the home of Robert and Ruth Cummings, where young Elijah learned the basics of life. He was taught to work hard, play by the rules, love your country, cherish your faith, respect your elderly. It was what they poured into him that began to shine through him for the rest of his life. It was an uncompromising understanding of who he was and whose he would forever be. And I don't know that in the many years we've known each other that Elijah ever gave a speech around me or had a conversation with me where he did not mention his mother or his father and the lessons of humility that gave him strength. I remember kneeling beside him at his mother's funeral service. Elijah was in a wheelchair. I kneeled down and touched the back of his hand and he gripped my hand as he was gripping also on the edge of that wheelchair just a few feet from his mother's coffin. And although you could look in his eyes that day and see the enormous sense of loss. You could always sense that at that moment that her spirit had entered into him. And he squeezed my hand and he just pointed to her like that through his tears and through his smiles. Throughout our years together, when I served in the Congress and then later when he served in the Congress, we would often mind one another that this is not a perfect nation and that we are not perfect people, that, but that God calls all of us in America to a perfect mission. Elijah believed it, and he lived it. He was the 20th century manifestation of a race of people who had suffered, endured, and survived. Three centuries of slavery, oppression, deprivation, degradation, denial and disprivilege. Thrust from his mother's womb as he was in the middle of an evolving civil rights movement, a movement of black renaissance, and like many of us were buoyed by the revolutionary talent of that day. Intasaka Shange, Gil Scott Heron, the last poets, Nikki Giovanni, Haki Mahabuti, Sonia Sanchez, and so many others. And through it all, he realized that the road less traveled was, in fact, the one less certain 
but that's the one he knew that he would be on anyway. You know, every day Elijah saw his faith around him because there was this mystery he used to tell me all around me, quite see, I, I can't explain it through the usual methodologies of science, whether it is the instinctiveness of the bumblebee or the orderliness of the cosmo, I have to have the faith to believe in what others see as being impossible. And he would repeat that. He would repeat the poet and say, I shall not shout my faith. Three times eloquent are the quiet trees and the glistening sod. Hushed are the stars whose power is never spent. He said, the mills and the hills are mute and yet they speak of God. And so I believe and I respectfully and submit to you that we use this occasion, this passage to another place to recommit ourselves to sharing Elijah's dream. It was also the dream of Martin Luther King and Fannie Lou Hamer, the dream of Du Bois and Washington and Tubman and Douglas the dream of all those nameless and faceless sharecroppers of his father's generation who laid their bodies down on plantations all over this country so that young Elijahs could run across them and get to the promised land. They couldn't always speak the king's English. They didn't have college degrees. They had to steal away to pray, but they never believed that they would ever give up and waver on the trust and belief they had in their children. They grew up, they became leaders, and they are who we celebrate. His sacrifices and achievements remind us, students, that Cravel was right when he said that no daring is fatal, that Sartre was right when he said the maximum hope would always lie closest to the maximum danger. That Dr. King was right, Elijah, when he said for the true believers, the darkness would be light enough. So how do we celebrate him today? How do we honor him as we get ready to recommit his soul and spirit back to God? Not by trinkets or false praise or ceremony or adoration, those things never meant anything to Elijah. We honor him instead by holding on to his example of commitment to a cause and by making it real in our own lives. He was unawed by opinion, unseduced by flattery, undismayed by disaster. He confronted life with the courage of his convictions and then confronted death with the courage of his faith. He taught us all how to hope and how to smile, how to laugh and how to cry. He taught us how to live and with grace and dignity, he has now taught us how to die. So what shall we say of him long after that last pebble of dirt is tossed to seal his grave? Let us say that Elijah was, as Shakespeare once said, a foe without hate, a friend without treachery, a victor without oppression, and a victim sometimes without murmuring. But above all, to those who knew and loved him, he was simply a good man with a good heart. One final thing. My preference would be for Elijah to be standing here right now, talking and speaking about me. But he said, you know, Kwaisi, there is neither rank nor station nor prerogative in the Republic of the Grave. And yet I know in a few minutes we prepare to send a big timber of a man to that grave 
who through the simple eloquence of his example defied the limitedness of others' expectations. So come on, Elijah. Come on and tell him what you told me the last time we spoke. You said, Kwaisi, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever thy lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Whose woods are these? I think I know. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. And yet those woods are lovely, dark and deep. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I Won't you give our, con our former congressman a tremendous hand? You may be seated. Now, I, I must share one thing. I have made a commitment to the family to arrive at the graveyard at a certain time. So for all who are yet coming, be very mindful. If you see me stand, we are moving forward. Thank you so very much. The Lord is good and is worthy of all of our praise. We come today to honor one of the greatest soldiers of Christ that has ever lived, Elijah was not only in the halls of Congress, but he was also a real Christian. It was nothing to have him show up in worship. And like his mother and father before him, he was a worshiper. He served the Lord with gladness. And so we come today to celebrate his life and to say to him, Thank you for everything that you've done, particularly for the oppressed and the underprivileged. We said to him, Bon voyage, we'll see you in the morning. How humbling it is that this great man called me his mentor. Elijah Cummings and I first met 50 years ago. To be precise, it was March the 26th, 1969. Elijah was an 18-year-old student at the high school I, that I had attended, Baltimore City College. The school had a Hall of Fame that honored distinguished alumni. Elijah, as the senior class president, concluded that the school should add some diversity to its Hall of Fame because no African American had ever been selected. Now, they explained to Elijah that the Hall of Fame honored graduates who had distinguished themselves in long careers. The average age of the inductees was about 60 years old. But Elijah persisted. He argued that the selection criteria should be changed because the school had excluded black students up until Brown versus Board of Education and that it would take decades before there were any African-American alumni in their 60s. Well, Elijah's relentless advocacy 
prevailed. And I became the beneficiary. And, and I was selected to the school's Hall of Fame. Now, I was 27 years old. <laughs> and my only claim to fame was that Speaker Pelosi's brother, Mayor Tommy D'Alessandro III, had appointed me to the Baltimore School Board. I first met Elijah at the Hall of Fame induction ceremony. I still have the printed program. <laughs> Here it is. It is dated March the 26th, 1969. Elijah on the program is listed as the president of the class, a member of the Hall of Fame Selection Committee, and the Assembly Chairman. <laughs> Elijah and I have been close friends ever since that day. After high school, Elijah's steps were like mine. He went to Howard University and was president of the student government. Then he came to the University of Maryland School of Law, where I was teaching. That led me, jokingly, to ask Elijah, are you following me around? <laughs> Elijah quickly rose in stature among Maryland lawyers. The Black Lawyers Organization, the Monumental City Bar Association, had existed since 1934 and the association's president was usually a senior member of the bar. That was until Elijah Cummings, a lawyer for seven years, became its president. When Elijah began his career in elected office, that's when that, are you following me around question vanished. He sailed way past me and way ahead. There were his terms in the Maryland General Assembly and then his years in Congress, where he fought to protect our democracy, encouraged young people, and looked out for his hometown, Baltimore. In Elijah's last political campaign, even though he was on the ballot only in the 7th Congressional District, he purchased 22,500 lawn signs and had them posted in every Maryland county. His name was not on any of the signs. They said simply, vote for the Democrats. Over the years, Elijah and I talked a lot, and we talked about everything. It seems like everybody. <laughs> so let me share just a few close-up observations. The public Elijah that you saw was real and authentic. That was the real and authentic Elijah. There was nothing phony about him. He genuinely believed the things that he said publicly. Elijah was kind and respectful to people of all stations in life. And he was sad when he thought that he had unintentionally hurt or offended someone. And Maya, we talked about you a lot. No, no, no. He talked about you a lot. Elijah really loved him some Maya. He often said, Maya is a genius. In fact, those were his two words for you, beautiful genius. I spoke with Elijah over the past few months many times. And as his health faded, he continued fighting for justice with the same persistence as that 18-year-old student 
who in 1969 was determined to integrate his high school's Hall of Fame. I've lost a dear friend, and he now enters America's Hall of Fame. of the new Psalmist Baptist Church, located at 6020 Marion Drive in Baltimore, 21215. Please stand. I am honored this morning to speak on behalf of the New Psalmist Baptist Church and to speak about Brother Elijah Cummings. To many of you, he was your political colleague, but to us, he was our church member. And he was not just a CME member. He didn't come on just Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. <laughs> but Brother Elijah was here. He posted just about every week. And not only was he here, but he was a 7.15 a.m. member. <laughs> and Sister Maya, you know you have to have good religion to come to church every week at 7.15 a.m. But Brother Elijah loved worship, and he loved this church. And you know, folks who love church invite their friends, invite their family members, and Brother Elijah was no different. So it's no surprise that in 1998, he invited President Clinton to come to church with him. Brother Elijah did not come here to be seen. He came to see his God. He did not come here because of politics, but because of praise. We were his church family, and he was one of us. So he, he carried us with him through the halls of power. He carried our prayers with him when he sat in those committee meetings. He was one of us. And because he carried us with him, we now get to carry him with us. <laughs> Brother Elijah's Spiritual DNA is now a part of our church family tree. And we will carry him with us. We will carry him when we speak truth to power. We will carry him when we give a voice to the voiceless. We will carry him when we, as the church of the living God, refuse to sit down. Because the church, like Brother Elijah Cummings, does not yield. If we die on Friday, we're going to get raised up again on Sunday. <laughs> Farewell, Brother Elijah. We will miss you. We know you are dancing with the angels and with young Tommy. And we look forward to seeing you in the morning when our work is done. God bless you.
Elijah's family plays a integral part in his life, and his family members are coming first by his, led by his daughters, then his brother. Two of his mentees are going to speak. A member from his congressional staff is going to speak, and then his wife, Maya, is going to speak. Won't you come in that water? I knew this day would come, but I never thought it would be so soon. My dad and I had a special bond, one that spanned the 37 years of my life and the 37 years of his life of public service. Our connection was and remains one of heart, spirit, and soul. It is almost impossible to put that connection into words, but I am deeply grateful for it. And today, I just want to say thank you, Daddy. So I've written you a letter, Dad, to express my gratitude to you for a lifetime of lessons, memories, and blessings. Recently, you said my handwriting was getting too small. So like in recent times, I would like to read this note of thanks to you aloud. Except today, Daddy, all these people have gathered to celebrate your life, so it's not just you and me. I hope, as always, to make you proud. Dear Dad, over the past week, Baltimore, the nation, and the world have celebrated your life and your contributions to our collective humanity. You were so many things to so many people. You touched so many lives. And that's because yours was one not only of duty and service, but one of compassion and empathy. You truly saw people, and they saw you. 
no matter their lot in life, no matter their politics, no matter anything that made them different from you. As you often said to me, thank you for just being you. You were the gift, and I have much to be grateful for. And while you were a congressman, Mr. Chairman, and a seasoned political leader, perhaps the most important title you held in your 68 years of life on this earth was dad. First, thank you for loving me before I even took my first breath in this world. I remember you telling me how when I was born you were amazed that you could hold me in the palm of your hand. Just one hand, this life, my life, in your hand. You and mom literally gave me life and we've shared an unbreakable connectedness ever since, which is what makes today so incredibly hard. While right now the words ring hollow in my heart, where since last Thursday I feel like a piece has been forcefully torn out, it is this connection and this deep and abiding love that endures even when I can no longer feel your big bear hug or give you a kiss on your forehead. Dad, thank you for teaching me the dual power of my beauty and my brilliance. This might sound boastful, but ever since I was a little girl, my dad always told me I was beautiful. That may sound basic and like a no-brainer. <laughs> um, but dad wanted me to understand and appreciate my blackness and truly feel that my rich brown skin was just as beautiful as alabaster or any shade of the rainbow. He insisted on buying me brown dolls that looked like me so that I could truly appreciate myself and what made me different from the width of my nose to the fullness of my lips and to the coarseness of my hair. Now, as dad would say often in speeches, just a footnote here, um, I vividly remember being on the playground in elementary school and a classmate calling me ugly, to which I retorted, well, my daddy says I'm beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I then proceeded to pull out his business card from my little purse filled literally with nothing else but rocks <laughs> and said, you can call my dad and ask him. <laughs> so thank you, dad, for also teaching me to be bold, to be confident, and to stand in my power, to stand up against bullies, be it their overt words or covert actions. You did not suffer fools, and you taught me not to either. Thank you for teaching me discernment, to spot those with false motives from miles away and to see the difference between blind ambition and true purpose and being called to a mission. Thanks for teaching me what leadership by example means by exhibiting it. And just to circle back on blackness and brilliance, Daddy, thank you for encouraging Adia and me to attend Howard University, your alma mater. You once quipped in a speech at Howard's Chapel the year before I enrolled that no matter where I decided to go to college, your tuition checks would be going to Howard. <laughs> thank you for investing in my education well before and through Howard. Thank you for teaching me to persevere. I remember when we took the training wheels off my bike when I was maybe six or so, and I went careening down the steep sloped alleyway behind the house and fell. I remember crying to you and telling you that I didn't want to ride ever again, and you told me that I could do it, and to wash off my scraped little legs and try again, and I did. Thank you for teaching me that I do know. You used to ask me questions on the way to school and lazily or maybe out of a lack of confidence in the answer, I'd just say, I don't know. You tell me, Jennifer, you do know. So tell me, what do you think? You always cared what I thought. That never stopped. From our first conversations to our last. Thank you for teaching me to strive for excellence in all that I do. Thank you for instilling me in me the idea that if I tried my very best, that is all I could ask of myself. Thank you for giving me an appreciation for the spoken and written word. I remember many a day, either in your law office on St. Paul Street or your office in the State House in Annapolis, where I'd be tasked with reading articles from the Baltimore Sun and memorizing them, I'm sorry, summarizing them. <laughs> on those summaries, the best score I could get was an E for excellent, and I always aimed for those. That summary writing led to writing for school newspapers in high school and college, and the career in communications I have now. 
It is no coincidence, it was preparation. Daddy, thank you for seeing me. I saw you. Thank you for nurturing me. I think I nurtured you in return. Thank you for loving me unconditionally and teaching me what love and leadership are by your example. I will miss your smile, your great big smile that could light up a room. I will miss your booming voice that would firmly sound, Jennifer, when I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> I will also miss the voice that was just quiet and plain saying things like, Jen, can you plug in my phone? <laughs> I will miss calling you after seeing you on TV to tell you what a great job you did and maybe sharing a couple of pieces of constructive feedback <laughs> for your consideration because you always strive to be better than the day before. You encouraged me to have a point of view and a thoughtful critique. I will miss you calling me before dawn on my birthday to sing your very special renditions of Happy Birthday, complete with a lot of riffs and soul, but perhaps not a steady tune. Um, <laughs> I will miss our exchanging Christmas presents and you immediately trying on whatever sweater or Under Armour tee or fleece was a part of the gift. I will miss opening presents from you and you saying, I saw it and it just looked like you. I will miss us having brunch just us two, or you, me, and Adia, or you, me, and mom, and ordering dessert and you eating more than half of it. Every time, it reminded me of us going to the harbor and getting ice cream when I was a kid. Secretly, Dad, I started getting bubblegum ice cream because I thought that finally when you asked for just a bite, I might get the cone back intact. <laughs> what I would give for just an afternoon at the harbor with you. You could have all of the ice cream, Dad. I will miss the way you squeeze so much ketchup onto pretty much everything, um, but especially the fries that ended up soggy with tomatoey goodness at the bottom. I will miss your wise words, I will miss our brief conversations between meetings and hearings, and I will miss the longer ones. I will miss our month or so long of recent Saturday night sleepovers when we just hung out and discussed just about everything in our lives. Sometimes we just stay silent and watch the latest 2020 murder mystery. I'd look over to you just to see your face and catch you catching a glimpse of, of mine. That is love, enduring love. We weren't just dad and daughter, we were confidants and friends, and daddy, I will miss that the most. So on this day, after so much has been said and a week filled with celebrations of your life, to steal a phrase from you, I just stopped by today to tell you how much I love you how much I thank you, and how much I will be indebted and forever connected to you. That does not change as you've transitioned from this life to the next. Our love endures. Rest well and rest easy, Daddy. You deserve it. I know our conversations and connections won't be in person anymore, but they will be just as they've always been, filled with heart, spirit, and soul. I love you, Dad. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, you'll have to forgive me, I'm reading off of my phone. I am a millennial, after all. Um, so, I wanna thank everyone um, for being here. It means the world to my family to know what uh, our father, uh, brother, uncle, son meant to his community and his colleagues and the people he worked with. And, um, I have to say to his staff, can you please stand up to my dad's staff if you're here? Um, they deserve it. Uh, I just wanna personally thank all of you the way that you loved my father makes us family forever. And I'm so sorry that you lost someone who was so much more than a boss to you. So, I'm confident that everyone in this room today knows exactly the type of man my father was. If you didn't, you wouldn't be here. He was a passionate leader, a dependable friend, and an unrelenting voice for change. His passion for his city, his state, 
and his country was evident in his practices and his policies. Many of his colleagues have spoken over the past week and today about what an honor and a privilege it was to serve with him. But my sister and I were fortunate enough to hold the highest honor, which was being able to call him dad. And I would be remiss if I didn't share a glimpse of what it was like to be his daughter. My dad would text me sometimes at 3 a.m. just to tell me he was proud of me or to give me words of encouragement. Whenever I call, he'd always answer, hey, beautiful. And I could tell that he was happy to hear from me. And he was never hesitant to give his opinion, whether asked for or not, <laughs> and was quick to remind me at any given moment that I owed him some money. <laughs> He wasn't a father known for patience, but rather for persistence. When I was getting ready to take my driving test, he made me parallel park what felt like 50 times in a row until I got it down to a science and I could not do it wrong. And that was a very long day, but I passed my test on the first try. <laughs> he always held me accountable and made sure that if I said I was going to do something, that I did it, and always encouraged me to be more giving. He instilled in me the same principles that my grandparents instilled in him, integrity, service, and humility. I could come to him with anything, ask him for anything, even Cardi B tickets. He didn't really know who she was, but he went out of his way, even from his sick bed, to make sure that I could go see her. He believed in me, believed in my dreams as if they were already realities. He was never afraid to invest time, knowledge, wisdom, and money into anything that I aspired to be. He was genuinely invested and committed to my happiness and well-being at all times. Last year, I gave him a card for Father's Day that said a parent's job is to see their child the way God sees them, and you do that for me. And I would encourage all the parents here and watching to see their children the way my dad saw me, the way God sees me, without limitations, not bound by obstacles or circumstances, and with the power to determine my own destiny. My dad not only encouraged me, he empowered me. He equipped me with the tools that have prepared me to stand here with you today. And he made it his life's mission to ensure that every child in the country was as equally equipped. We owe it to him, I owe it to him, to not let his life's work go in vain. In his, oh. In his infamous first speech on the House floor, he recited his favorite poem, Just a Minute. And as I mulled over which words to say today, I heard a song playing on the radio that embodied that same spirit. In the words of Eminem, the moment you own it, you better never let it go. You only get one shot, do not miss your chance. The opportunity comes once in a lifetime. My father seized his moment, and because of it, we are all gathered here today. And to all of you, when the time comes, I hope that you seize yours as well. Thank you. I love you, Dad. God is good. I come before you this morning with a very heavy heart. Elijah was my older brother by three years. And uh, I can tell you now that 
At times it was easy, other times it wasn't. I followed him into middle school, and the teachers expected so much of me. <laughs> Mr. Liner at the seventh grade social studies school, first thing he said, oh, you're Elijah Cummings' brother? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I expect great things from you. When it came time to pick our high schools, as most of you know, Bobby, Elijah went to Baltimore City College. By the way, I call him Bobby. The family calls him Bobby. Uh, people have asked me, about 100 people have asked me over the last week why we call him that. And it's because his godmother didn't like the name Elijah. <laughs> so, so if you don't mind, I'll refer to him for, as Bobby from now on. That's, that's what we call, I've called him for the last 64 years. The day came when I had to select the high school to go to. And of course, he wanted me to go to City. He said, uh, he said, Al, okay, let me explain that one. <laughs> my name is James, my middle name is Alfred, but they call me Al for short. Okay. He said, Al, you really should go to City. It's an all boys school, so you have no distractions. Yeah. So I said, uh, I said, Bobby, I love distractions. <laughs> I said, uh, I can't concentrate without distractions. <laughs> that's when I learned the definition of oxymoron, or better yet, ironic. And that's when he taught me the definition of ironic. But he was a, a great brother. Uh, we're going to miss him dearly. I want to thank the city of Baltimore. I want to thank Speaker Pelosi uh, for the service yesterday, all the comments that were made. I mean, it was a beautiful service. I'm going to miss him dearly. And uh, the last thing I want to say is that when I was leaving his home yesterday, after returning back from Washington, I was getting in my car, and there was a gentleman on the, sitting on the steps, and he, uh, he asked me, where are you coming from? And I told him, from my brother's house, Elijah Cummings. And he was so apologetic. He said, I am so sorry. I'm, 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 I'm so sorry. He just felt really bad. He just wanted to give me a hug. So. Uh, he said, uh, you know, I'll do anything you need me to do. He said, I'll cut your grass. He asked me, he said, where do you live? I said, Virginia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said, well, he, he, he thought for a second or two, and he said, well, that might be a problem. But he did tell me that he was going to meet me out there to get today again. Uh, he had something for me. I'm not sure if I'll be able to meet with him or not. But that was, I thought that was the nicest thing. Because he's the type of person. He was the type of person that Elijah loved. Elijah wasn't the type of person who would look up to people and want to be so high. He wanted to be in a position where he could help those people who, who couldn't help themselves. And so... And so, again, I just want to thank everybody. My niece already thanked the staff. And the reason, the reason why I was going to thank them was because during my last meeting with Elijah, I spent uh, an entire Sunday with him about four weeks ago, which really wasn't the last time I've seen him since then. But uh, I spent uh, Sunday with him watching the Chiefs play the Ravens, the Ravens lost. But uh, he had a question for me. Uh, the question was, uh, for those of you who don't know, I lost a son. Uh, my son was killed about eight years ago. As a, he was a student down at Old Dominion. And that, <clears throat> that haunted Elijah for most of his life, for the rest of his life. He asked me, he said, why did Christopher go to Old Dominion? And I said, well, because his friends wanted to go there. He wanted to go with his friends. And he said, uh, he said, man, I wish he hadn't gone to Old Dominion. That, that, that broke me to my heart when he, when he was killed. And that wasn't the first time he told me that. He's told me that many times. And the only thing that, uh, that he took to his grave that was unresolved was who took my son's life. So hopefully that will turn around here sometime soon. But again, I want to thank each and every one of you because you know you can give someone your car, you can let them borrow your keys, you can let them borrow your home, your clothes, whatever the case may be. But the one thing that you cannot get back is time. 
and each and every one of you have given up hours of your time just to honor my brother. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is John Alexander. We've lost a giant and an incredible friend, and I'm honored to be here this morning to say a few words about my friend, Congressman Elijah Cummings. We've all read a lot of beautiful eulogies about this great man, but I'm going to try to tell you a few things that maybe you didn't know. He used to tease me relentlessly. Like you, President Clinton, he called me an honorary brother. <laughs> I met Congressman Cummings in 1996. I was lucky enough to be on his first legislative staff. And for the next 23 years, we developed a very close personal relationship. We met almost weekly for lunch to discuss family, politics, books, life, even the Ravens and the Orioles. One day, Mr. Cummings was late for votes. And this is in the infancy of cell phones, and I couldn't reach him. Later in the day, one of my colleagues came up to me and said, hey, I saw your boss changing a tire on Route 95. What, excuse me? No, your boss was on 95 changing somebody's tire. I saw him by the side of the road. He never said a word to me while he, while he was late, and that's just the way he was. Mr. Cummings always said 80% of life is showing up. All of you had somewhere else to be today, but you're here. My, I try to teach that to my son, who's 16, who's here today. Took him out of school. I think that's an excused absence. <laughs> and I see many of my colleagues here today, as well. And we all had a very special relationship with this great man. I see a lot of friends from his early political days, those that saw his potential those that urged him to run for Congress, and I see friends who and I'm truly, truly grateful for this opportunity to speak. He always said he was an ordinary man doing an extraordinary job. However, he was not an ordinary man. He was a brilliant man. He was born to lead, and he served for all the right reasons. He was a gifted orator. He could make audiences shout with enthusiasm and cry at the same time. He was a voice of moral leadership. He had a wonderful sense of humor. He had an infectious laugh. You couldn't help but to laugh with him once he started laughing. He was a humble man. He never professed to know it all. He was always learning, always studying, always asking questions. He genuinely cared about people and his staff. About 20 years ago, I was unhappy in a job. I was almost between jobs, and I called Congressman Cummings, and I wanted some advice. I was about to quit my job. And I'll never forget the words he said to me that day. I won't let you fall. I won't let you fall. He spoke of the kitchen crowd. He met the people during parties, gatherings, who would hang out in the kitchen and complain. He wasn't a kitchen crowd guy. He was generally not concerned or motivated by money or titles. He was a man who straddled two worlds. Maybe I helped him bridge the gap from middle, inner Baltimore 
and state legislatures to the halls of Congress. Maybe he leaned on me that way in the beginning, but he helped me too. He helped me understand the world through the eyes of an African-American man. He taught me lifelong lessons on compassion, humility, love, family, and God. I will miss his fatherly advice. I will miss his brotherly love. I will miss his wisdom and compassion. When my father died, he attended the funeral. He took the time and called my mother. And when I was struggling with the death of my father, he spoke to me about a musical he loved, one of which I saw with him for the first time, The Lion King. Remember these words? He lives in you. He lives in me. He watches over everything we see. Into the water, into the truth. In your reflection, he lives in you. And if I have a message to everyone today when you leave this beautiful church, when we face the challenges and temptations of everyday life, think, do I want to be part of the kitchen crowd? What would Congressman Cummings do in this situation? So please honor the memory of this good man. Open the door for someone. Carry someone's groceries. Shovel your neighbor's walk. Be a mentor to a young person. Maybe stop and change somebody's tire. Thank you. Good morning. The first time I met Congressman Cummings, we stood together not far from here to call attention to the 20 year difference in life expectancy across our city. He called on us to do the work that's so much bigger than us. That's about our children and the generations yet unborn. When we finished, he wrote down his number and he leaned close and said, call me. You hear me? I will help you with whatever you need to help our city. And he did. Whenever we needed funding for mental health, dental health, child health, violence prevention, any program to help our residents, Congressman Cummings fought for us and he got us the resources. He told everyone how we in Baltimore are effective and efficient. How what we do is about saving lives. And he came to countless events to speak on the opioid epidemic because we needed his moral authority to overcome stigma and treat addiction as the disease that it is. And every time he would speak to every member of my team to say thank you. He'd say thank you for turning your pain into your passion that is your purpose. And he told them, as I heard him tell his staff whom he loved so much, and the young people that he mentored, he would say, I want you to replace me someday. And he'd look right at each person and in his presence, we know that we are seen, we're heard, and we matter. When I suffered a personal tragedy, a miscarriage, he wrote to me to say that he and Maya were there for me. When I went through other challenging times, he'd remind me that for every season, there's a reason. And we may not know that reason, and there's a lot that we cannot control. But what's in our control is how we choose to live the life that we have, and how we must always let our conscience guide our conduct. When I eventually had my baby, 
he quoted the poet Carl Sandburg that a baby is God's opinion that life should go on. And he thanked me for helping God to deliver this powerful message. And when I told Congressman Cummings that my husband and I decided to name that baby, our son, after him. When I told him, he cried. Little Eli is now two. And one day expecting his baby sister in a few months. <laughs> but there have been few months in his life when I haven't gotten some message or a call asking about him. How's the baby, he'd say. How's my little Eli doing? In what would be my last conversation with him, I told him how blessed I have been to have his mentorship. And he said, I am the one who is blessed because you are part of my destiny as I am a part of yours. Now, all of us here are forever part of Congressman Cummings' destiny as he is forever a part of ours. All of us who are fortunate to call him our mentor, our friend, our colleague, all of us who are fortunate to love him and be loved by him. He challenged us to be better and we are all better for knowing him. Now today we feel the deep pain over his loss. We feel the deep pain for his one and only beloved Maya, for his daughters that he always calls the gifts that keep on giving, for his entire family whom he loved so deeply. We feel the deep pain for the loss of this great man who has touched every part of our city and every one in our city. Well, I believe that Congressman Cummings would ask us to turn that pain into our passion that is our purpose. I believe he would ask us to honor his life's legacy by carrying on his life's work and making it our own. I believe he would ask us to call upon our better angels and think about the work that is bigger than us, so much bigger than us. That's about our children and the generations yet unborn. That's about fulfilling our shared destiny to fight for the world as it should be. To Congressman Elijah Eugene Cummings, we love you. We thank you. May we be worthy of you. And may you rest in peace. First, giving honor to God, to the family, respected dignitaries, and extended friends. I sincerely appreciate the honor and privilege to express my deep appreciation for my friend, Congressman Elijah Cummings. The remarks that I will give on today are entitled, The Final Lesson. When I think of the Congressman, I'm reminded of a quote from Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee once said, the key to immortality is living a life worth remembering. The congressman asked me one day to drive him to DC for meetings and votes. At first, this would be, I thought this would be a temporary assignment that would last a few days. Little did I know that this would turn into two and a half years of working with an angel.
suddenly my life transformed from district director to bodyguard, mechanic, advisor, driver, chef. The cars would ask what we eat for lunch. And most importantly, friend. I've worked with the congressman for 15 years, and he always took the time to teach me and the staff valuable life lessons. However, the last two and a half years were different. He once told me, he says, Spikes, if you give me five minutes, I can teach you something that took me 20 years to learn. Let that marinate for a second. Most of the lessons you may think were verbal, but I learned more from watching the congressman than I did in conversation. Lesson number one, compassion and kindness. The congressman believed that empathy resided in all of us. He thought that compassion and kindness brought us closer to God. He believed that those attributes were the key to uniting the human spirit. Lesson number two, the congressman believed in bridges. He knew that an opportunity, no matter how big or small, meant the difference between life or death and a person's matriculation in this world. As we traveled together, I always met someone who was grateful that the congressman took interest in their life. And had he not, they would not have had the blessings and opportunities that they have today. Lesson number three, value your friendships. He said that he would always be obedient to God because he knew that God worked through us in a spiritual capacity. What does this mean? The congressman and I enjoyed talking about carpentry. It's through our conversations that I learned an important lesson. Always check on your friends. Be the foundation for your friend when their house collapses. And be the roof for your friend when the rain comes. <laughs> Lesson number four, pass the ball. The congressman once told me that a true leader shares leadership. To get the ball down the court to win, share the ball. Give others the opportunity to lead. He exercised this lesson by, work, by looking to the youth for answers and choosing people to join him on his mission to help all Americans. We saw this in his committee assignments. Lesson number five, which is hard for me, work through your pain. The congressman was one of the hardest workers that I ever knew. When we traveled through the country, in his mission to fight for the soul of our democracy, when he spoke on the House floor or traveled to a community center to talk to children, he was always in pain. However, when it was time to address his audience, the congressman transformed into a spiritual warrior. It was as if he had received the cure to his pain. No armor, no sword, no shield, but God's, we God's weapon of unconditional love for people. <laughs> However, when he was on stage, his cure was that he knew he would be truly speaking to a generation he would never see. For days, I've been trying to figure out the first, the fifth lesson, but I finally got it. If he were here, the congressman would tell me, Harry, remember to be greater than your pain. Transcend darkness and become the light to lead to better days. Continue to fight when all hope is lost. And if one leg doesn't work, use a walker. At least you will be standing.
in my spirit, the congressman wants me to say one last thing <laughs> to the staff. Thank you for everything you gave me. I could not have been the leader without you. To Vernon, thank you for being the general of my army. To family, thank you for letting me be Bobby. To my wife, thank you for your love and support. To my children, when you get lonely and you need me there, watch the Lion King and remember my favorite part when they say, he lives in you. I will always live in you. To all in attendance, remember this final lesson. Life may change. You may change. Hard choices will come. But the congressman proved to us all that courage and will are timeless. Thank you. To God be the glory. Yeah. To God be the glory. Yeah. This man lived for God, and he is of God. I have come here today to say two simple words. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. The 7th Congressional District, he loved Baltimore City. Baltimore, thank you for everything that you did to pour into him, to make him who he was, to allow him to be and to rise to greatness. Howard County, he once and always said whenever he spoke to you, it is my honor and privilege to serve you, and he meant every word of it. To Baltimore County, he enjoyed serving you as well, so thank you so much for supporting and working with him. To all his congressional colleagues, it was a distinct honor and privilege to walk beside you, to, to fight the good fight, the Congressional Black Caucus he was a proud member of and once led, uh, to all the leadership of the Senate and certainly the House. Nancy Pelosi, thank you. He considers you his mentor. <laughs> President Obama, he was so proud. He was so proud to stand with you and for you early, to be your co-chair here in the state of Maryland, to serve as your chief defense attorney on the House Oversight Committee, <laughs> and to make sure that you and your administration were all right. But you didn't have any challenges like we got going on now. So his job became harder over time. That being said, President Clinton, he was absolutely honored to be your friend. He counted you amongst his friend. When he invited you, you showed up. One of the proudest moments of his life when you came right here to New Psalmist Baptist Church and worshiped with us. We thank you so much. Secretary Clinton, oh my goodness. He spent many an hour defending you. 
against spurious claims. And now he had to go on to actually work to fight for the soul of our democracy against very real corruption. I want you all to know that it was not easy. What Congressman Chairman Cummings did was not easy. And it got infinitely more difficult in the last months of his life when he sustained personal attacks and attacks on his beloved city. And while he carried himself with grace and dignity in all public forums, it hurt him. Because one thing you do not know about Congressman Cummings, he was a man of soul and spirit. He felt very deeply. He was very empathetic. It was one of his greatest gifts. And it was one of the sources of his ability to be a public servant and a man of the people. And so with that, to have the week's activities basically be laid out in such a glorious way, to be a tribute to the great man that he was, to the great legacy that he left, to be the first African-American to ever congressman, to ever lie in state in the U.S. Capitol. Now, it is true that he dictated every aspect of his service today. And he would have told me, Maya, I don't want a service at the U.S. Capitol. But I felt like very strongly that they were trying to tear him down. And we needed to make sure that he went out with the respect and the dignity that he deserved. This was a man of the utmost integrity. Do you hear me? He had integrity. And he can't. Just two days before he died, he was in a lot of pain. He could no longer walk. And he kept saying, I'm tired. I'm ready to go. And so the, the wonderful world-class staff at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, at the Johns Hopkins University, they came in and they said that we wanted to give him sunshine therapy. And so they rolled his entire medical bed out of the room and to the 14th floor, the rooftop of Johns Hopkins Hospital, where they land the helicopters for life-threatening situations. And we rolled out, and it was a glorious, and it was a beautiful day, with light everywhere. The sun was shining, and it was just absolutely glorious. It was God's day. And he looked out over the inner harbor, Harbor East. He looked toward South Baltimore, his beloved South Baltimore, where he grew up in his early years. He looked toward the downtown, and he looked toward the west side. And he said, boy, have I come a long way. <laughs> and he absolutely came a long way. And so with that, I just want to say thank you for pouring into him. Thank you for supporting him. Thank you for allowing him to serve you because it was his greatest and honor and privilege 
to work on behalf of all of you. The family has been heartened. Our pain has been lessened by all the love we have received from everyone here in the city, the state, the region, and the world. And so I just want to say thank you. God is good. Take care. Elijah's life touched many. And we gather here today not for, as Maya said, a sprint to the finish line, but we gather here to pay homage to a man who meant so much to all of us. Two individuals thought it not robbery to make this morning a morning spent not in mourning, but in sharing with the family and the friends of this congressman. I speak of the one and only Honorable William Jefferson Clinton, 42nd President of the United States and the Honorable Barack Obama, the 44th President of the United States. They're going to come in that order and share their thoughts now. Will you greet President William Clinton? Thank you very much, Bishop, Maya, all the members of the family and honorees. Bishop, I thank you for many things, but especially for the decades of guidance and genuine friendship you gave to Elijah. It is true that Almost exactly 21 years ago, he invited me to New Psalms on the Sunday before the election. <laughs> and I remember, you know, you, I loved that you introduced the staff because we'd all be dead without the people that are helping us. But if you're a president, your staff is always trying to tell you why you shouldn't do something <laughs> or you shouldn't go somewhere. I remember this very well. They said, it's Tuesday, Sunday before the election. Why would you go? I get why you want to go to an African-American church, but why would you go to Baltimore? I mean, come on, they're so good to you. They always vote for you. And why would you go for Elijah Cummings? He's been in the house 15 minutes. He literally hadn't finished one term yet. I said, I just got a feeling this is something we ought to do. And if we do it, we'll know whether it was right or not. And so the bishop rolls out the red carpet. Thousands of people were there. And you may remember, we got in some trouble, didn't we? <laughs> we got in some trouble. They, people criticized us for having a get out to vote event in a church. They said it was inappropriate. And as I remember, Elijah reminded people that our constitutional rights, including the freedom of religion, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of speech, depended on people giving 
voice to them in elections. End of debate. Then, I got to listen to Elijah talk that day. You talk about a lousy deal. It was, I had to follow both the bishop and Elijah coming. <laughs> and uh, at least I'm getting in ahead of you and President Obama today. I'm just so, <laughs> I'm just. In my old age, I'm the warm-up fact. I'm glad to do it. Anyway, Elijah was great. And he ended with his quiet and reasoned and rhythmic voice growing into his booming voice by quoting that wonderful verse from the 40th chapter of Isaiah. They who wait upon the Lord will have their strength renewed. They will round up <clears throat> with wings as eagles. They will run and God go weary. They will walk and faint not. And he just kept doing more and more. The crowd was going crazy. Over the course of these last few days, I've had the chance to think a lot about Elijah's life. He really did sort of mirror Isaiah, who had one of the greatest one-liners in the history of human affairs. When the Lord asked, whom shall I send and who will go for me? Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. Elijah Cummings spent a whole life saying, send me an entire lifetime. It's not even a teenager when he hauls down to the swimming pool and joins a group to integrate it and for his trouble gets banged on the head with a glass bottle leaving him a lifetime scar, which he bore with honor. And then the people of Baltimore sent him to Annapolis, and then you sent him to Washington. On behalf of the rest of the nation, I'd like to thank you. You did a good thing. And then, I was looking over all the things that he worked on just in the four years we were together. He was elected the year I was re-elected, 1996. He had this amazing array of interests. But we all know now that at least until certain things happen, his legacy is how ardently he honored his oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. I think he did it for a lot of reasons. He loved the fact that his parents' humble lives made his a great American story. And he loved that it confirmed his faith, but he knew that without the Constitution, the laws that were passed under it, the rights that were guaranteed by it, and the abuses it was designed to prevent. Without that Constitution, he would not have been in Congress. And so he said to himself, I am certain every day I will not let this promise be sullied. And he did his best. And while doing his best and fighting his heart out, sticking up for Hillary and lots of other people, many of whom were voiceless and weak and will never be known. While doing all that, he actually made, in one of the most partisan periods in our country's history, a lot of Republican friends. 
Why did he do that? How did he do that? I think he did it because everybody could see he was a real deal. He was doing what he believed, his heart was in it. And I think he did it because no matter how hard he fought and how passionately he argued, he tried to treat everybody the way he wanted to be treated, the way he thought America should be treated. You know, you can't run a free society if you have to hate everybody you disagree with. I mean, sooner or later, if, if you've been married 45 years and both of you are thinking, <laughs> you're gonna have a disagreement or two. Sooner or later, if you're in a business or a team, or in a campaign, and you're thinking you're gonna have disagreements. He believed that he should treat people the way he wanted to be treated. And he believed if everybody accepted his broad, endearing, inclusive definition of one America where we respect our differences and think what we have in common matters more, and we all live under the same set of rules, and we all believe that under those rules, those of us who have more than we need should do more to help those who don't have enough, that everything would work out okay. Now, that's what he believed. And being friends, he was so proud that he could help resolve the personal spat between his Republican congressional friend and new member of the Democratic caucus. But he believed. So here's what I want to leave you with. Elijah spent his working life in the tradition of Isaiah. He went again and again and again. But I think in his lasting legacy to us, we should think again about the prophet Elisha for this reason. He was about to be killed for his ardent promotion of his faith. He hid in a cave, either within or next to Mount Sinai. He received a message from God to go up and stand on top of the mountain and wait for the voice of God to speak to him. So look, he'd already had a pretty hard time. Just like at the end of Elijah's life, he's already had a pretty hard time. You gotta go through this too. So there's Elijah standing on the mountain and a huge wind came so strong it broke the rocks of the mountain. But the Lord was not in the wind. Then an earthquake came shaking everything but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Then the fire came, but the Lord was not in the fire. And then, what does the scripture say? A still, small voice. Elijah, by that point had gotten rid of all the pomp, all the circumstance, all the glory for the still small voice. I love this man. I loved every minute I ever spent with him, every conversation we ever had. I loved his booming voice, but we should hear him now in the quiet times at night and in the morning when we need courage 
when we get discouraged and we don't know if we can believe anymore, we should hear him. Let our Elisha be for us what he himself heard, a still, small voice that keeps us going, keeps us grateful, keeps us happy, and keeps us moving. Thank you, and God bless you. Bishop and First Lady and the new Psalmist family. To the Cummings family, Maya, Mr. President, Madam Secretary, Madam Speaker, Governor, friends, Colleagues, staff, the seeds on good soil the parable of the sower tells us stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. The seed on good soil. Elijah Cummings came from good soil. And in this sturdy frame, goodness took root. His parents were sharecroppers from the South. They picked tobacco and strawberries and then sought something better in this city, South Baltimore. And Robert worked shifts at a plant, and Ruth cleaned other people's homes. They became parents of seven, preachers to a small flock. I remember I had the pleasure of meeting Elijah's mother, uh, Ruth, and she told me she prayed for me every day. And I knew it was true. And I felt better for it. Sometimes people say they're praying for you, and you don't know. They might be praying about you. <laughs> but you don't know if they're praying for you. But I knew. Miss Ruth was telling the truth. So they were the proverbial salt of the earth, and they passed on that strength and that grit, but also that kindness and that faith to their son. As a boy, Elijah's dad made him shine his shoes 
and tie his tie, and they'd go to the airport, not to board the airplanes, but to watch others do it. I remember Elijah telling me this story. Robert would say, I have not flied. I may not fly, but you will fly one day. We can't afford it right now, but you will fly. As grandmother, as Elijah related, uh, and as grandmothers do, uh, was a little more impatient with her advice. Your daddy, she said, he been waiting and waiting and waiting for a better day. Don't you wait. And Elijah did not wait. Against all odds, Elijah earned his degrees. He learned about the rights that all people in this country are supposed to possess with little help, apparently, from Perry Mason. <laughs> Elijah became a lawyer to make sure that others had rights. And his people had their God-given rights. And from the State House to the House of Representatives, his commitment to justice and the rights of others would never, ever waver. Elijah's example, a son of parents who rose from nothing to carve out just a little something, a public servant who toiled to guarantee the least of us have the same opportunities that he had earned, a leader who once said he'd die for his people even as he lived every minute for them. His life validates the things we tell ourselves about what's possible in this country, not guarantee, but possible. The possibility that our destinies are not preordained. but rather through our works and our dedication and our willingness to open our hearts to God's message of love for all people, we can live a purposeful life. We can reap a bountiful harvest. That we are neither sentenced to wither among the rocks nor assured a bounty, but we have the capacity the chance as individuals and as a nation to root ourselves in good soil. Elijah understood that. That's why he fought for justice. That's why he embraced this beloved community of Baltimore. That's why he went on to fight for the rights and opportunities of forgotten people all across America, not just in his district. He was never complacent, for he knew that without clarity of purpose and a steadfast faith, and the dogged determination demanded by our liberty, the promise of this nation can wither. Complacency, he knew, was not only corrosive for our collective lives, but for our individual lives. It's been remarked that Elijah was a kind man. I tell my daughters, and I have to say, listening to Elijah's daughters speak, uh, that got me choked up. 
I'm sure those of you who have sons feel the same way, but there's something about daughters and their father. And I was thinking I'd want my daughters to know how much I love them, but I'd also want them to know that being a strong man includes being kind. That there's nothing weak about kindness and compassion. There's nothing weak about looking out for others. There's nothing there's nothing weak about being honorable. You're not a sucker to have integrity and to treat others with respect. I was sitting here and I was just noticing the Honorable Elijah E. Cummings. And, you know, this is a title that we confer on all kinds of people who get elected to public office. <laughs> We're supposed to introduce them as honorable. But, but Elijah Cummings was honorable before he was elected to office. There's a difference. There's a difference if you were honorable and treated others honorably. Outside the limelight. on the side of a road. In a quiet moment, counseling somebody you work with. Letting your daughters know you love them. You know, as president, I knew I could always count on Elijah being honorable and doing the right thing. And people have talked about his voice. There is something about his voice. It just made you feel better. <laughs> you know, there's some people, they have yeah, that deep baritone, a, a prophetic voice. And when it was good times and we achieved victories together, that voice and that laugh was a gift. But you needed it more during the tough times, when the path ahead looked crooked when obstacles abounded, when I entertained doubts, or I saw those who were in the fight start to waver, that's when Elijah's voice mattered most. And more than once during my presidency, when the economy still looked like it might plunge into depression, when the health care bill was pronounced dead in Congress, I would watch Elijah rally his colleagues. The cost of doing nothing is not nothing, he would say. And folks would remember why they entered into public service. Our children are the living messengers we send to a future we will never see he would say, and he would remind all of us that our time is too short not to fight for what's good and what is true and what is best in America. Two hundred years to three hundred years from now, he would say, people will look back at this moment and they will ask the question, what did you do? And hearing him, we would be reminded that it falls upon each of us to give voice to the voices and comfort to the sick, an opportunity to those not born to it and to preserve and nurture 
our democracy. Elijah Cummings was a man of noble and good heart. His parents and his faith planted the seeds of hope and love and compassion and righteousness in that good soil of his. He has harvested all the crop that he could. For the Lord has now called Elijah home to give his humble, faithful servant rest. And it now falls on us to continue his work so that other young boys and girls in Baltimore, across Maryland, across the United States, and around the world might too have a chance to grow and to flourish. That's how we will honor him. That's how we will remember him. That's what he would hope for. May God bless the memory of the very honorable Elijah Cummings. And may God bless this city and this state and this nation that he loved. God bless you. Thank you. For just about 40 years, Congressman Elijah Cummings was an active member of the New Psalmist Baptist Church. Each and every Sunday morning, his faith was strengthened and enriched through the preaching ministry of Bishop Walter Scott Thomas Sr., whom he not only called pastor, but also friend. After the choir has lifted the great hymn of the church, it is well. The next voice we shall hear is that of Congressman Elijah Cummings' pastor, Bishop Walter Scott Thomas, Sr., the senior pastor of the New Psalmist Baptist Church and the presiding prelate of the Kingdom Association of Covenant Pastors. I ask that as he mounts the pulpit desk, we might stand in honor and reverence to the office he holds as bishop in the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ.
what a day. Lean over to somebody and tell them, I don't mind being here. We come to honor one who has meant so much to all of us. We have listened and we have heard and we have been blessed by many who have come to speak about the congressman. There's a word that I want to share. My role is slightly different. My role is slightly different from all of those who've had the privilege to speak. I've come with a different task. Elijah was my friend for almost 40 years. He sat right over there. For a while, he sat right over there. At the other church, he sat on the second or third row. At our other church, right up front. Elijah was here every 715 service. On one occasion, he and Maya brought friends to a later service, a service they did not normally frequent and found that that service was altogether different <laughs> from the one to which they were accustomed. But he and she in church every Sunday morning. Elijah's last act, official act, congressional act in a sense, was to sign some subpoenas I saw him that morning. I did not know he was still working, but he was working. But that was not his last official act for God. His last official act for God, and let me preface it by saying this. So many times preachers will talk about speaking truth to power. It is a common statement known by many, we speak truth to power. The real problem is power is not often there. But Elijah's last official act for the kingdom of God was to bring power to church. I didn't get a big amen on that. But his last real act did not take place last Wednesday in the hospital with pen in hand and paper before him. His last act took place or takes place today when men and women from every aspect of life, from those who run corporations, those who stand in Hollywood halls, those who sit with robes behind benches, those who pass legislation in cities, counties, states, and government have all made their way to the place that he came every Sunday morning because his last act, I believe, Maya, I believe this with all of my heart, is that he wanted you to know why he came to church. Somebody better hear me today. Elijah wanted us to know why he came to church. There's a word in Psalm 73, verse 15. If I had not spoken out like that, I would have betrayed I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to, all, to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood. For 37 years, he sat in this church, but all his life, he was a servant of Almighty God. 
Oh, yes. We would talk on the regular, week after week. We met, we met, oh, about 1982. Perrin Mitchell was then the seventh congressional district congressman and was having a banquet downtown. And I had accepted a responsibility I never would normally expect to do both the invita invocation and benediction. I had planned to do the invocation because I was going to sneak out but I had made the commitment to do both. And so that meant I had to stay. And I was seated beside this young lawyer. And I sat with him and we talked the whole while. The speaker was bad and boring. <laughs> so we chatted all the way through it. I found out that he was from South Baltimore like I was. He was right over the Hanover Street Bridge I was on the other side, the Ponderosa, the garden spot of American living, where the elite come to meet Cherry Hill. And he was from South Baltimore proper. And so we talked about that. Then we changed the conversation after we realized we had that in common and traveled on to where we went to school because in Maryland, in Baltimore, where you went to high school, is critical. He informed me that he had gone to this castle on the hill, this place with a black knight, commonly called City College. And I informed him that I had gone to the only high school in this city, the Baltimore Polytechnic Institute. And we laughed over the salad as we talked about that. We found out we had so much in common and we became friends. And little by little, I saw him coming into the church and then he joined, his partner joined, family joined. And Elijah became a permanent fixture here for a time. Our legal counsel, always my counselor. And we became fast friends. And every Sunday morning, Elijah Cummings is in church, and God is moving him higher and higher and higher. Don't tell me serving God won't lift you up. Don't tell me the steps of a good man are not ordered by the Lord. God raised him one step after another. His Lord, Elijah, Phi Beta Kappa. Phi Beta Kappa from Howard University, graduating the University of Maryland Law. Elijah could have been in any 500 company. He could have been a major lawyer downtown with any of the major law firms. But instead, he decided to open his practice to help people who could not find help for themselves. A smart, brilliant attorney running a shop and beginning, and God is elevating him with no political machine behind him whatsoever. None. Elijah, from the time that he ran for his first office to the time that he ran for his last seat in Congress, Elijah Eugene Cummings never had a political machine behind him. Never. He had no clubs. Elijah just had people. He had people from here and there and everywhere who would come out and support him. God raising him up every Sunday in church. God raising him up higher and higher. He runs for state delegate, wins that seat. People like Lena K. Lee, Verda Welcome, and others who in their heyday had, and Juanita Mitchell and Perrin Mitchell a, a, had planted a seed in him and it had begun to grow and he wanted to step into public office. And so he climbs in, but God is still lifting him. And in 1996, God puts him in Congress. And as the president said, he hadn't been there 15 minutes <laughs> when he invited William Jefferson Pre Clinton, president of these United States, to come to his home church and worship. For every year he was in Congress family, for every year he was in the state house, for every year he was a lawyer, he was in church. And the question comes on the last thing that he can do, 
because the request came to have his service at the Basilica, to have his service downtown, to have his service in the various other large places in town. But the decision was made by his wife that his service would be one place, the New Psalmist Baptist Church. And he was bringing power to church. Somebody better hear what I'm saying. Elijah has brought power to church. Buses rolling up here. Somebody better hear me. I mean, buses coming from everywhere. We got police. I mean, the only thing we don't have is a couple in the ceiling. They are everywhere. We've got security. We've got, we've got secret service and public service. We've got everything everywhere. They've all come to church. We had folk calling up, I want 20 seats. I want five seats. And you know what we did? We said, we'll get you every seat you want because Elijah wants you in church on the day he goes home. Somebody said, who are you inviting? We inviting everybody. As Larry Young used to say, Lottie Dottie and everybody. Somebody said, you got too many VIPs. I told the team, everybody is a VIP. Bring everybody and treat them like a VIP. Our fraternity is here. The sororities are here. Morgan is here. You name it, every place of power, Elijah has called them in. Why did Elijah think you ought to be in church? Why did Elijah think you ought to be in church? Help me somebody. Not somebody say, uh-oh. I tell you why Elijah wanted you in church, because he found something in church. God, I feel like preaching right now. Walt, I feel like doing a dance for my friend Elijah. Elijah wanted you in church because he wanted you to know what he found in church. Elijah found in God's house and with God that God will help you recognize your own frailties but cling to your own possibilities. That's what Elijah came to church for. Elijah would be the first one to tell you he wasn't perfect. He'd be the first one to tell you that he struggled and wrestled like everybody else, that he had to climb the rough side of the mountain. You don't come to church to know the obvious. You come to church to find out, is there a way to still be somebody when I've got baggage hanging on me? Is there a way to do something when my life is so messed up? I wish some of us in this room could quit acting as if our lives were all tied together with a nice bow on top. Some of y'all are wondering how you gonna make it and how you gonna get through and how you gonna climb the mountains. Elijah said, I come to church because in church he looks beyond my faults and God sees my needs. God looks at past my shortcomings. Nudge somebody and tell them, I don't always do right. Some of us, and listen, I know some of y'all didn't nudge nobody. Nudge them and say, stop lying and nudge somebody. You know you have problems like everybody else. Elijah said, I come to church because in church I can recognize my failures and I can claim my possibilities so that when I leave church, I can go out of here and tell somebody else it is no secret what God can do in your life, what he's done for others. He will surely do. That's why I want you here. You only see people's frailties. You don't see their possibilities. That's why I want you here. You only see how they messed up. I want you to see what they can become. God, I wish I had some folk here who could remember that because some of us didn't always come from living high on the hog. 
Some of us came from no meal, miss meal, and skip meal. Some of us came from mama doing your hair in the kitchen. Some of us came from walking to school, help us God. Some of us came from those brown bags you cut up and put over your books and call them book covers. Some of us came from starting our first business in a basement. Somebody better hear me. God will show you all things are possible if you believe. I'm not going to be long. That's why he wanted you here. He wanted you to come with your brokenness and understand that every week he brought his brokenness and God gave him and showed him his possibilities. I remember when he ran for office for Congress for the first time. No machine. People he thought would be with him weren't. Hello. Wait a minute. Come on now. Folk he thought had his back, left his back. Others put a dagger in his back. And folk were saying, he ain't going to win. He doesn't have a chance. I remember talking on the phone with him, and I could hear him crying on the other end. Hear him crying. I said, Elijah, you going to win this. He said, Doc, how do you know? I said, my daddy said so. And on that night he won, political heads were turned. I got in my car, rode down there as a proud pastor of Elijah Eugene Cummins and said, look at God, take you from South Baltimore and put you in Congress. Don't you tell me what God can't do. Why, right, that's the first thing. You know why he wanted you to come to church? He wanted you to come to church because he knew, and he came to church because all of us, especially those in this room, need a regrounding of your grounding. Need a regrounding of your grounding. Some of us have forgotten what we were brought up on. We've forgotten it. When somebody died in my neighborhood, you had a grief buffet. Somebody came in with a ham. Somebody bought greens. And somebody bought a pie. Somebody was around the neighborhood collecting money. Child, I remember when there were only a few cars in the neighborhood. And so everybody would pile into a car like a, 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 a national almanac trying to set a new record, going to the beach. I remember when we had barbecues in the backyard and when a sprinkler was your swimming pool. But we grew up with integrity. We grew up caring for each other. We grew up with a sense of selflessness. Help me somebody. Elijah came to church every week because he knew how easy it is to forget where you've come from. As a friend of mine once said, you know, a person was speaking, you know, um, trying to let people know how impressive they were. And they were telling them that the church was having a dinner after church and they were having chitterlings and collards. Somebody said, what's that, chitlins and collards? <laughs> but sometimes we have forgotten where we've come from. And sometimes we have to make sure our nation does not forget the very things that have been planted in our spirit. Elijah brought you to church today so that that moral compass can be reset, so your grounding can get back, so that we can remember we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights of which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness.
He brought you to church to be regrounded. Because we can, we can forget it. We can get so caught up in the new place where we are that we forget the old place that brought us there. My God, some of us grew up on amazing grace. Some of us grew up on the Lord is my light. And we've forgotten that in the, in the end, we will not stand before presidents or kings. We will stand before he who is the judge of the ages. And when I see him, I want to stand shoulder to shoulder with all of those who have stood before me and not be ashamed because I'm grounded in where I came from. His mama and daddy were preachers. They were Pentecostal preachers. Y'all miss that. No, don't you equate everything alike. Oh, no, 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 no. In a Pentecostal home, you're going to learn how to pray. Am I right, brothers and sisters? And in a Pentecostal home, you go into church. Or somebody going to plead the blood on you. They're going to pour oil on you. And I promise you, they're going to cast out a devil. Yes, they are. Am I right? Am I right? Elijah could never want it to forget. Get that. He didn't want to be driven around and forget when he had to scrape money together to make payroll. Somebody better hear me in here. He didn't want to be flashy and forget what it was like to have folks say, I I I'll pay you later, Mr. Cummins, and, and be able to live with that and accept it. He never wanted to lose what was grounded in him. And I, I think he brought you to church because too many in our country are forgetting where they came from and what was instilled in them. We were not taught to be divided. Mama would back slap you if you talked out a turn. Somebody in here, remember this line? I didn't beat you for what you did. I beat you for how you said it. Help me somebody. Elijah said, I never want to lose that ability to talk to folk and to get along with folk. We may disagree on the issue, but you are still a person and I'm still a person and we're still trying to get somewhere. My mama taught me that. My mama taught me I'm not worse than anybody, but she also taught me I'm not better than anybody. And she taught me that the God I serve will make a way for everybody. She taught me how to take care of the least, the left, out the lonely, those that can't lift themselves. Do you know why our Elijah was so articulate? He never forgot his grounding. I heard people mentioning that Elijah was a prophet or rather was like the prophet Elijah. Nudge somebody and say, get this. They're talking about Elijah the prophet, but Elijah was a prophet. A prophet, according to Walter Brueggemann, an Old Testament scholar, says a prophet does three things. A prophet critiques the dominant ideology. A prophet articulates the public pain. And the prophet offers up creative solutions for those who cannot find their way. I've got news for you. Because he stayed grounded in who he was, Elijah would always critique the dominant ideology. He didn't care whether you liked it or not. His voice would rise. His lip would quiver. He'd say, come on now. We can do better than this. He look at you and the hand sometimes starts shaking. You see that knot on the other side of his hand just moving. Why? Because Elijah critiqued what was not right in America. But not only did he critique, he spoke for folk who had no voice. Why? Because he grew up having no voice. He grew up in a community, in a world where we were not allowed to do what we can now do. And Elijah said, as God gives me breath, I will speak for folk who can't speak. I will articulate for folk who cannot articulate. I need you to grab somebody and tell them, don't forget where you came from. But there's a last reason. 
He came to church. He came to church, and then I'm done, and then we take him to his final rest. Elijah, I hope. I'm telling them why. You came to church. There's a last reason he came to church. On Monday to Friday, he's known as the Honorable Congressman Elijah Cummings. Most of you in Washington and in other places know him as the Congressman Elijah Cummings. If you travel the city of Baltimore and the streets of Baltimore and someone meets him, Rarely will they say Elijah. Rarely. There's too much venerated respect for this man who lives in the heart of the city. Too much respect. And they'll say, Mr. Cummings, you, you go around town in Baltimore, Mr. Cummings. People on the street, Mr. Mr. Cummings, because he's spoken of with great reverence. In New Psalmist, he's brother Elijah Cummings. And let me share this with you. Monday to Friday, he's solving the problems of the world. In the streets and neighborhoods, he's trying to show possibilities. But when he comes here on Sunday, no fanfare, no entourage, no nothing. He and Maya just come marching right on down that little side, sit right on down. Nope. No smile for the camera, just come in and take their seat. Among everybody else in the house, because he comes here for the same reason they do. To get the strength to go back to the assignment that God has given him to do. Some of you are weary in well-doing. Some of you are weary because of all that you have to face in these turbulent times. Some of you are worried and feeling fearful about the state of the union and how things are going to happen. But week after week, Elijah Cummings came to church so that that kind of pessimism could never take rootage in his soul. So that that kind of hopelessness and despair could never be the tenor of his conversation. He came every week because God was telling him, I'll give you the strength to go back and make a difference one more week. All I need you to do is have faith and believe that I will make a way somehow. You all, as Maya said, you don't know how sick he's been over these years. There were times I didn't expect to see him coming to church. And Maya would say, oh, he's coming. He's coming today. And he would roll right on in because Elijah would say, as long as God gives me strength, I'm going to be able to go back and fight another day. Never fighting with despair, never fighting with pessimism, fighting with the one weapon Jesus Christ made sure he had. And that weapon was an unshakable faith, a faith that God did not bring me this far to leave me now. Uh oh touch somebody and say, hear this, that God didn't bring our nation this far to leave us now. And if God be for us, y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. If God be for us, he is more than the world against us. So I can rise up and go back to the challenge. I can go back to my district. I can go back to my committee because the strong hand of the Lord is on me. His wish for you is that you will have a faith that that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe. I'm done now. Sleep on, Elijah. Where are you, Elijah? I'm in glory land. It took me a while to get here, but I can stand before my God, and I can hear him say, well done, and may the work I've done, may the work I've done. May the work I've done speak for me. I want to 
us all to stand. Well, buddy. It's the last moments. I need you to hold somebody's hand. This service is nearing its final moments. But this is his gift. This is his gift to you. This is why he wanted you to come to church. Some folk didn't get here today. Some folk didn't make it. Some folk said, nah, but you came. You came. Don't ever forget. And maintain your faith in the rightfulness of God sitting on the throne.
Hold for faith as we stand. Would you bow your heads with a closing prayer? Father, thank you for the little boy in South Baltimore, teen in City College, the young adult in law, and the seasoned man in Congress. Thank you for the father who spoke to his girls and made them proud. Thank you for the husband who loved his wife to the very end. Thank you for the family member who knew the wide expanse of family love. Thank you for the Christian the saved, sealed, sanctified servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose weapons of warfare were not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Now, God, be praised. Thank you for letting us know him. And now may he enjoy the eternity you have prepared for him. In the mighty matchless name of the one he served and to whom we surrender, Jesus Christ, our living, eternal, and soon coming King, we all say amen. The flowers are going to be taken out and then we'll begin the final departure we ask all persons to remain in their place and in their space until the family has exited. The pallbearers are asked to assemble at the rear of the church. Thomas Associates to the front. And we shall depart this place singing the anthem of our people that he enjoyed so much and has spoken so much to who we are. Lift every voice and sing. Let every person sing to the glory of Almighty God this melody.
you look on the back of your programs and you will see where the family will be receiving friends, they invite you to go to that place and they will be more than happy to express with you. Thanks to the March Funeral Home for the fine way they have successfully led the family through this moment of deepest pain and grief. True. 